We're live. Good afternoon. Good early evening to our friends that are watching um, from the East Coast. As you can tell from the smile on my face, I'm excited today about our special, special guest um, whom I um, have come to adore from a distance, uh, not just for his work here, um, but from his input, uh, as short as it was, into the African-American documentary with Henry Lewis Gates, PBS, uh, C-SPAN interviews that I've been able to watch, uh, listening to his book on abolitionists. Uh, and so it, it's just been a joy. But the main reason he's here today to talk to us is about now a superhero of mine, uh, uh, Richard Allen. Uh, oftentimes, uh, if you that's the book, and let me plug this now. We have over 90 copies left. If you are here today and you want a copy, hit us up at Hurt for the Hurting. We're going to get that to you. All we're asking you to do is join our mailing list uh, for we can get interviews like this and other things out to you and a donation of any amount. I mean, one penny, one dollar, doesn't matter. And then if you can't even do the donation, don't worry about it. Just let us know. Uh, you want the book and we will afford to go that. I believe that this will change the landscape of our mind. As you will see, I think in our, as we get into the interview, there's a lot of parallels to the political chaos, pandemic, civil unrest, mental strain, economic uncertainty uh, to the times of which Richard Allen lived, Bishop Richard Allen lived. Uh, I am not AME, um, but I am a new fan of their movement. And, and everything that relates to it. Always been a fan and appreciator of it. And that's what led us to, um, with an irony of a former president, uh, uh, bringing up his books and reading Dr. Mark and Marvin McMichael's uh, book on 100 influential uh, black Christians and leaders. Uh, read a, a short article of Richard Allen. My name always been in my mind of someone I needed to know about, more of. So I've immediately began to say, well, I want to read a biography for all of these figures. And uh, Richard Allen was the first that came to my mind to do so. Uh, did my research and came across this masterpiece of scholarship, uh, historianism, and so on. And again, we have it with us. And then I did, I just, I, I, I went reaching. I went reaching, I found me an email, found me a number. We had interns on staff. Can you reach out? And Professor Newman, Dr. Newman was so gracious, so kind to join us here on the Lowly Hurt for the Hurting platform to talk to us about, again, this masterpiece of a work of literature uh, that he did on such a central figure, not in African-American history, but in American history. And uh, we're going to dive right in. But before we do so, um, since we have him here, I would love to get to know him a little bit better uh, before we dive into the topic of the book. But let me begin by asking Dr. Newman, how are you doing today? How are you doing in light of everything that's taking place in our nation? Um, very well. Thank you so much, Reverend Hurt. It's great to be with you. It's an honor to be on this uh, online interview. Um, I think everything you said makes me feel uh, embarrassed, except for the fact that uh, it's all about Richard Allen. Richard Allen is a hero of mine. I think he's a great historical figure. He's important for the Black church for American history. And as you said uh, very eloquently, he's someone who speaks very directly to our time. And so he has an ongoing importance that I think all of our students, uh, every American citizen needs to know about. So it's wonderful to be here to talk to you about it. It's wonderful to have you. Those that are listening, just hit the like button. Let us know that you're out there. Uh, drop a comment in the box if you have a question that you would like for us to get to. We are sensitive to that. We'll try to get to it. Uh, start a watch party. Share this page on your platform. Uh, Jordan, our producer, we're going to ask him to start a watch party on our page and to share it to our, our church and other uh, groups that we are connected to. Uh, tell us, Professor Newman, a little bit, as much as you feel comfortable about your background and what led you into your profession that you're currently in now. Well, you know, I've always been interested in history and civil rights, and uh, I was born out in Los Angeles back in uh, the 60s. Uh, my parents moved out to the East Coast in Buffalo, uh, and I grew up very interested in civil rights struggles, 
uh, the struggle for justice uh, in and beyond the black community. And when I decided that I wanted to become a professor, I studied the abolitionist movement and the coming of the Civil War. So my early work was on the abolition movement between uh, the beginning of the Republic in 1776 and the start of the Civil War. Uh, and I came across this fascinating, unforgettable figure while I was doing research on that book named Richard Allen. Um, he was sort of the Martin Luther King figure of his day. He was someone who was speaking truth to power. He was holding up the American Republic to its own ideals and saying that by sanctioning slavery and racial injustice, you are violating your own creed. He was a person of faith, uh, someone who galvanized people uh, in his community. He was born an enslaved person in Philadelphia or the Mid-Atlantic in the 1760s, but he bought his own freedom, became uh, a really important and powerful speaker, uh, and he just gained a lot of adherence to his cause. And by the early 1800s, he was probably the most famous African-American figure, certainly the most famous African-American civil rights leader uh, in the American nation. And I thought, uh, no one has written a modern biography of him. There were wonderful books about him in the early 20th century, um, particularly a book by the African-American scholar Charles Wesley, uh, but nothing in the more uh, recent era. And I thought that's a shame because we've got this renewed interest in uh, early American history. So when I started researching this in the early 2000s, people were uh, talking about the founding fathers, uh, their debates over slavery and race. And I thought, uh, we're missing a key voice here. And Richard Allen is that key voice. So I spent about five years working on this uh, biography, just researching it, uh, and then a couple of years writing it. And when it was published in 2008, 2009, um, it really kind of hit a nerve because I tried to define Richard Allen as a, a founding figure in two different ways that I think uh, made people take notice. On the one hand, he's a really important figure in the black community, founder of the African-American church, founder of the first civil rights struggles in American society, uh, a founder uh, in terms of written protest. He writes a series of uh, protest pamphlets during his life that um, articulate his grievances against racism and slavery. And we can read those uh, documents today. But he's also a founder, I think, for American democracy. And what I would tell people as I went on these uh, speaking tours and as I say in the book, you can't understand the evolution of American multiracial democracy without understanding Richard Allen. He stands up to those founding figures like Jefferson who want to delay things on the abolitionist front, who say, well, you know, this is going to take time and uh, – we really can't attack slavery. now Richard Allen says you have to attack slavery and racial justice, racial injustice right now. So when we have these debates about the founding era and the 1770s and the American revolution, we don't often include African-American voices, but Richard Allen is there at the time saying, we've got a major problem with slavery and racial injustice. And unless and until we attack these problems, we can't say that we're a great nation either in a secular or a sacred sense. And he spends his entire life trying to prosecute this freedom struggle. He dies mm -hmm. in 1831 profoundly ambivalent about uh, American society. And he thinks about leaving America. And in that sense, he's the first person within the black protest movement to really articulate this notion of double consciousness. That at one and the same time, you can be uh, an African-American figure who wants American society to do better, but be profoundly out of step with some of the main currents and racial injustice. And Richard Allen articulates that at the very end of his life. And so I think in that sense too, he puts down a very important kind of grievance for subsequent African-American reformers and other uh, protest figures. Uh, Frederick Douglass calls Richard Allen a hero. W.E.B. Du Bois calls Richard Allen a hero. People in the 20th century, A. Philip Randolph, Rosa Parks, they grew up in the Amy Church. So Richard Allen's vision, his uh, worries about um, the American uh, nightmare, not just the American dream, are things that influence generations of protesters uh, right down to our own time. And so I think... Um, 
even 10 years, 15 years after I first started working on this book, he's even more relevant than ever. Wow, absolutely. Well, let's let's dig into it. Let's set a historical time frame of both his birth and his life, uh, yeah. when he was born, what's the scope of our nation at this point? And I'm, I'm speaking of Delaware and, and him being born a slave. Uh, yeah. uh, take us into uh, not just his birth, uh, but what he's born into and not just his enslavement um, as an enslaved African, but what's taking place as it relates to uh, the Revolutionary War and all those currents that are taking place at that time. Yeah, great questions. So Richard Allen was born in 1760. So, you know, that's a generation before the American Revolution starts. We're not sure uh, how his uh, ancestors had come to uh, occupy the places they did in the Mid-Atlantic region. We know, for example, on his mother's side, he had some Native American ancestry. We don't know if two or three generations before he was born, his ancestors arrived. There's some suggestive evidence in family histories, but he is born uh, as an enslaved person in February of 1760, um, possibly in Philadelphia, possibly in Delaware, but it's important to know that slavery at that time is fully legal in British North America. The American colonies are under the thumb of the British. The British have established and enslavement cities. And so Richard Allen is like the majority of people of color up and down the Atlantic coast. They are uh, in some form of unfreedom, um, often in servile slavery. There are a smattering of free people of color. So someone that Richard Allen will come to know later on in life, James Fortin is a freeborn person of color uh, in Philadelphia around this time. Um, but Richard Allen is born as an enslaved person and this galls him. So during his adolescence and teen years, as he grows up, he thinks what a lot of enslaved people think. Why am I enslaved? Especially as the American colonies start to debate their existence with the British government and talk about things like freedom and rights and liberty. Richard Allen thinks more and more about the way that he is denied these things. So mm -hmm. when the revolution starts in the 1770s, Richard Allen is thinking very consciously about the way that these principles that the revolutionaries are talking about will apply to him. So there's fighting around uh, his uh, home uh, when he's a teenager. He talks about uh, crying because he feels like his life will be uh, spent in bondage, but all these ideas about freedom and liberty are out there in the world. And so he hopes that he can grab onto them and apply them to his life. Uh, at this time, he also encounters the word of God and mm. uh, he encounters black as well as white preachers roaming the countryside, talking about spiritual freedom, spiritual liberty. And the Methodist church is a very important vehicle for these things because uh, the Methodist church in Great Britain is often a dissenting church, as you know, and that mm -hmm. means to a lot of people who are stuck in oppressive circumstances. So the Wesley brothers, John and Charles Wesley, are who are the architects of early Methodism in Great Britain, they speak to people who are in the countryside and, in, and stuck in um, ironworking facilities in parts of London, uh, the early Industrial Revolution, and they're talking about, you know, their spiritual existence uh, in the universe, you know, that no matter what your circumstances and an oppressed, as an oppressed person, um, there's a place for you in God's heaven. You're equal mm -hmm. anyway spiritually. Um, you can use the word of God to raise yourself up out of these terrible circumstances. And so when these preachers uh, and their word spreads to uh, colonial and then revolutionary America in the 1770s, people like Richard Allen, enslaved people hear that message and apply it to themselves. So it's important to know that Richard Allen, at an important time in his life, when he's a teenager, starts hearing these uh, preachers uh, in and around his neighborhood talking about spiritual equality under God. And he's combining that with the secular words he's hearing from the revolutionary about rights, the revolutionaries about rights and liberties. So by the time he's 17 or 18, 
he has a pretty full sense of what spiritual and secular freedom means. These are things that are not uh, reserved for elites in society, even for white elites in society. These apply on an interracial basis. And so Richard Allen starts following uh, these interracial preachers who are holding camp meetings, great meetings of hundreds or even thousands of people. He's interacting with uh, white Christians. He's holding hands and praying with white Christians. The American Revolution, in many ways that are lost to us, has this really powerful moment of interracial possibility where yeah. black as well as white people gather together and see a righteous God intervening uh, in their lives. And this is one of the few moments in American society where black and white people are actually paying attention to the very same biblical story of Exodus, mm. right? Where this God intervenes in human history and says to Egyptian slaveholders, you know, sin no more, release enslaved people. And when they don't, a righteous God uh, wreaks vengeance upon them. So initially, uh, white preachers and white citizens think that, think that this is their story under the British. The British are oppressing them in the way that the Egyptians oppressed uh, the Israelites. And then African-Americans hear this story and they say, no, no, no. You <laughs> as white people are oppressing us as African-Americans. And so both groups are listening to the story and saying, you better do better or a white or, or a just God is going to intervene, whether you're a white master or a British oppressor. Um so this is why, in short, Richard Allen believes in some of the preachings of the Methodist um, preachers that he's hearing because he thinks this message speaks to him. And so he eventually uh, converts to Methodism and he uses the Methodist uh, preaching circuit to basically create the means for his freedom. Uh, he has Methodist meetings in and around his master's house. He eventually asks his master if he can bring preachers into his home for prayer meetings. His master says, that sounds interesting. Um, and so one of these preachers comes into his home. And I'm pretty sure that Richard Allen knew what this preacher was going to say, maybe even talked to him about what he was going to say. And he used a verse from the book of, Van of Daniel, uh, which was aimed at his master. Um, and I talk about this in the book, thou art weighed in the balance and found wanting. And mm. when his man hears this, he has this really powerful epiphany um, about um, his relation to a just God. And Richard Allen very strategically approaches him right after that meeting with the Methodist preacher and says, um, okay, so let's talk about me purchasing my freedom. And Sad to say, but this is one of the ways that enslaved people like Richard Allen have to earn their freedom in the 18th century. They have to buy themselves out of bondage because they're viewed as property. Um, yeah. So Richard Allen has to literally work for his own freedom. But for Allen, the important news is that his master, who has heard this quaking sermon, allows him to do that. And Richard Allen wastes no time in going out and earning money, and he pays off his freedom agreement early. So by the early 1780s, Richard Allen is a free man, and he really believes that um, the Methodist church and the the message that he heard in the, the Methodist discipline was the vehicle for his freedom. Uh, and he goes out on his own preaching mission and tries to convert people, black as well as white, to the word of God. But he always does it with a social justice message. That's the important thing. He is not someone who's only talking about scripture. He's talking very early on about something that people in Martin Luther King's time will talk about uh, and know well, which is the social gospel. Unless you bring it to the grassroots and people who are very literally oppressed and owned by other people, the Methodist word means nothing. So at a very early stage of his ministry, Richard Allen's talking about social justice. Wow, that's amazing because you get the, a peep into the strategic thinking of Allen, um, yeah. all the way from the Revolutionary War where he sees this and others 
uh, African Americans at the time see this as not just an opportunity uh, for these British colonies to be become free and become United States, um, but he also sees as an opportunity for the enslaved people that have been captured from their homeland to build hope. And we know that that was not offered to them in, in eventuality, but it never, <laughs> excuse me, it never escaped the mind of, uh, of Bishop Allen, nor uh, do you see his strategicness in the scenario that you just brought up. And I hope everybody catches that, that he didn't just invite this preacher to his master's house just to share the word of God, but also to convict him and to, <clears throat> to use that. And we'll see that later on in his, his famous scene of walking out of St. George Church, uh, that there is, Alan Mine is working as well as his actions. He's very strategic um, in his movements and his statements and his words, which leads me to um, how you began the book uh, uh, speaking on his eulogy of George Washington. And you get very nuanced in that uh, presentation throughout the book. You go back to it. And yep. as you answer that question, I want our listeners to understand as well uh, that uh, Allen was just as lethal with the pen as he was in the pulpit. And uh, he's very strategic in how he does that. We'll hopefully have time to talk about how he does it with the yellow fever, the pandemic of Philadelphia of the day, um, if you will. And so uh, talk to us a little bit about the right, the eulogy of, of George Washington and what you think in your scholastic studies uh, that um, Alan was getting at that was deeper than the words in the presentation. I love that phrase. He's lethal with his pen because he is. Um, he's known as a great preacher and he's known as someone who can really stir people through his voice and the way that his voice is an instrument of big and powerful ideas. But he really spends a lot of time trying to, quote unquote, master the power of the written word, too, because he knows that's also a way to um, create a freedom movement. Um, he's coming of age at a time when the written word is part and parcel of re revolutionary movements in American society, right? You think of the Declaration of Independence as this great revolutionary doctrine, but it's written down. You know, it's uh, a piece of written protest. And this, for Alan, tells him that if you're going to be a powerful civil rights protester, you've got to work on multiple fronts. You've got to work on the organizing front. You've got to be a great speaker. Um, you've got to be able to code switch and talk to different communities. But you've also got to be able to um, have a way with words. And mm -hmm. so uh, throughout his life, he writes very powerful literary treatises on freedom. And he writes a couple of powerful treatises before this eulogy of George Washington. But the eulogy of George Washington is one of his least known but most powerful uh, pieces of written protest because it's an address to the nation. It comes when he's uh, middle-aged, so Alan's about 40 years old. He's built his church. Um, his church has faced uh, a lot of racist activity in Philadelphia where he settled. Philadelphia at the time is the seat of the federal government. So for 10 years before Washington, D.C. is built as the nation's capital, Philadelphia, because it's the largest city in America at the time, serves as the nation's uh, capital city. And so Richard Allen knows that officers of the federal government are there. He knows that Congress people, that members of the Supreme Court, that presidents are in town, in his adopted hometown. He actually has a chimney sweeping business and he has chimney sweepers who go to George Washington's house at least on two occasions to clean the first family's chimneys. Um, and there are enslaved people there. And eventually a couple of those enslaved people run away. And so we can think about the way that Richard Allen might have been an instrument for their freedom. But when George Washington dies in December of 1799, um, it's a really powerful moment for the American Republic. And Richard Allen wants to use this moment for the civil rights struggle that he's trying to build. 
Um, and so he gives a eulogy of George Washington in his independent church that a white figure hears and eventually asks Alan if he'd be interested in publishing in a newspaper. And Alan, Alan jumps at the chance. That eulogy is then reprinted in papers in New York and Baltimore, as well as Philadelphia. So it's reprinted up and down the Atlantic coast. So again, Alan is thinking about the way that his words can be lethal to slaveholders throughout America. And he does this by realizing that most people who are saying, you know, George Washington has died and this is a very tragic moment for American society because what are you going to do without our leader? They're not talking about the most important thing in George Washington's legacy, which for Alan is his will. His will stipulated that over a hundred enslaved people would be freed after his wife passed away, um, which is a kind of uh, view into the future. But very quickly, Martha Washington realizes, I should probably liberate these enfla enslaved people <laughs> that my husband promised freedom to so that I don't meet a hasty demise. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, they do actually gain freedom uh, relatively early. Um, but this is important to George Washington because he's been wringing his hands like a lot of uh, Virginia slaveholders, like Thomas Jefferson during the 1780s and 1790s. But the key difference for Allen is George Washington acts. Mm. And George Washington, as Richard Allen says, realized there was only one thing that could be a stain on his character for the rest of eternity, and that's slaveholding. And so Richard Allen gives this eulogy and he knows he's going to publish this somewhere. And he says, you know, this is an important moment because a slaveholder like George Washington realized that he was accountable, that he was accountable to a higher power. And he realized that in terms of the secular words that the nation, you know, tried to follow, liberty and just for, justice for all, um, were abrogated by slaveholding. So Richard Allen gives this sermon in which he says to people, yes, we should celebrate George Washington's memory, but for only one reason, one reason only, and that's because he was an emancipator at the end of his life. And so Richard Allen's message is a biblical message. Go and do likewise, slaveholders of America. <laughs> um, and it's interesting to think about an African-American person publishing that eulogy in 1800, January of 1800 is when that eulogy is published. Um, and the way that some white editors look at this, because we have a head note from an editor who says, you know, this is a really powerful sermon and we encourage, you know, uh, our white readers to not be scared of this sermon, but to read it and embrace it. So that tells you that Alan was strategic in his thinking because Think about this. If he had come out and said, and I go through this with my students, I go through this when I go on lecture tours and people say, wait a minute, Richard Allen gave a sermon in which he eulogized and celebrated George Washington. And I say, yes. And they say, how could that possibly be? He was a slave And I say, I didn't say Richard Allen liked George Washington. I didn't say that behind closed doors in his church, Richard Allen didn't condemn George Washington. What I said was Richard Allen, always the strategic civil rights leader, gave a eulogy on civil rights, which used the memory of George Washington to build a freedom struggle to higher heights than it had been. Because if he had come out and said, I don't need to hear what George Washington said or did, he was a hypocrite, whites would have stopped reading. They wouldn't have listened. Richard Allen knew that. He was a step ahead. And so he said, George Washington is a great man because he was emancipator. In other words, what he was saying was emancipation is holy, it is patriotic, and it is doable. Those were the three things that people said, like Thomas Jefferson, when people challenged them and say, why aren't you emancipating enslaved people? And they would come back and say, well, they'd wring their hands. So Richard Allen is now people on notice and said, the person that you're celebrating Americans is the greatest American who ever lived, emancipated enslaved people at the end of his life. What are you doing? Go wow. and do 
likewise. Yes, he said that. It, it, it's so strategic. You know, you you bring that out wonderfully. Uh, that he's not. This not. This not an endorsement of of George Washington as much as it's an endorsement of freedom of slavery. But he crafts it so well. He he does it so well uh, that um, it's so unassuming to those. It just sort of sneaks up on them. Let's stay with his pen um, and talk about his writings as relates to yellow fever and uh, what is taking back taking place then. Um, sort of parallels is an epidemic, not a pandemic. Um, but yet it's still, it's at a critical uh, location in America, how that shifts, the propaganda that was uh, created after that, and how, again, Alan with his pen uh, subsets that. Well, Alan with his pen, and it all goes back to Alan and, you know, the social gospel ideas that he has in his ministry. So we're a couple years before the eulogy on George Washington, we're in the fall, late summer of 1799, terrible yellow fever epidemic breaks out in Philadelphia. Again, largest city in the United States. It's just recovering from the Revolutionary War. Yellow fever spreads by mosquito bites, but no one knows that. So initially, when the yellow fever starts spreading in Philadelphia, people think it's associated with miasmas, um, these uh, clouds of illness that circulate through society, but most often they hover over um, oppressed neighborhoods. So poor people, African and African American neighborhoods. This is what many leading uh, medical figures uh, in early American society associate with the uh, spread of disease, miasmas. Um, so uh, the yellow fever spreads. People are starting to quarantine themselves off. People are running away from Philadelphia. People who are wealthy enough to do it, especially white, wealthy Philadelphians, go to Philadelphia, New York. Um, so there's a lot of chaos and there's a lot of death. Um, as bad as the coronavirus is right now, uh, it pales in comparison to the uh, death rate that Richard Allen in his adopted hometown of Philadelphia would have witnessed. So there's about 50,000 people in Philadelphia in the early 1790s. Uh, in about four months, the death toll is over 4,000 people. So roughly about 10%, 8 to 10% of the population. And it's the capital city of the United States. So Alexander Hamilton, founding father figure, comes down with the yellow fever and he's sick with it. Um, most of the newspapers shut down. Thomas Jefferson leaves the city. He's an officer of the government. George Washington leaves the city. city. He's an officer of the government. So there's chaos associated with the capital city. And people are wondering if Philadelphia, if the American capital is going to survive. Um, African-Americans do end up coming down with the yellow fever, but it's a little later that it reaches them um, because their populations are segregated a little more. Um, we're not talking about the rigid segregation of the later 19th century, but you know, African-American communities are spread out throughout the city and often segregated in smaller numbers in white communities. Um, but eventually they do get sick with the yellow fever. But when the yellow fever first breaks out, they're not coming down with it. So white leaders start wondering if black leaders have an immunity. Um, the leading physician of the day, Benjamin Russ, wonders this. He's an abolitionist. He thinks maybe this is a moment where, again, a just God has intervened in human history and given African-Americans an immunity so that they can help uh, save the infected city. They can serve as nurses and pallbearers and medical workers. Richard Allen thinks on similar terms, but what he's really thinking when city leaders have debates about who can help the infected city is African-Americans have a chance to prove that they're just equal, not even in the eyes of God, but in the eyes of the Philadelphia white community. In other words, if they go out in the community and they work um, in infected homes, infected neighborhoods, they help set the city right, they can bolster the abolitionist movement and prove that they're equal citizens deserving of equal voting rights, um, a lot of other equalities. 
again, it's sad to say that Alan has to think in these terms, but he's thinking at the beginning of a movement culture. So, you know, if we go back and we look at, um, let's say the 1950s and the way that Martin Luther King Jr. or Joanne Robinson, the architects, the Montgomery bus boycott, you know, their first goal is to just um, desegregate buses. They're not really thinking, um, you know, that they're going to topple desegregation. That's going to take years, they, they realize. So Richard Allen is just thinking about ways to make inroads into a society that sanctions slavery. Um, only 10 years, 12 years before the yellow fever, uh, Pennsylvania was a slaveholding polity. It had several thousand enslaved people. In 1780, it passes uh, a gradual abolition law. So Richard Allen is trying, you know, to work these mini miracles. Uh, and he thinks that this is one way to do that. So he goes out into the city. He works as a, an aid worker. He goes into homes where families have run away, where people are infected. He administers what's known as the bleeding cure. And uh, this has been taught to him by uh, physician Benjamin Russ. You bleed people. You mm. cut back of um, their, you know, area on, on their back and you take a, you know, a little bit of blood, a quart or a pint or whatever. And in doing this, you balance the body's fluids again. And Rush believes that this will, you know, um, expel the yellow fever. So Richard Allen goes to hundreds of homes with other black aid workers. Uh, we're talking about majority white uh, neighborhoods and he goes into their homes and he's got a blade in his hand and he cuts them to bleed them and <laughs> he don't them out of his home. They say, my God, we're so happy you're here. You're going to save us. So Richard Allen really starts to think, wow, maybe this is an important moment uh, offered by God. Um, and so, you know, this happens for a couple of weeks. Richard Allen eventually gets ill with yellow fever. He survives. The yellow fever abates when winter comes. Um, and he's thinking, okay, we're going to be thanked by the city and the citizenry. Now we're going to be able to prosecute the civil rights movement in all the ways that we dreamed. We're going to get rid of uh, the vestiges of slavery. We're going to get voting rights. Um, we're going to have equal schools. You still have segregated schools. All these things are just going to happen because of the aid we rendered to the city. Doesn't happen. Mm. Because when people start coming back to the city, you know, we're talking about a city that's rebuilding itself. Um, they start, certain members of society start spreading rumors that uh, African Americans either took advantage of the yellow fever to charge high sums for their medical work, or um, they took advantage of the yellow fever to um, pillage and plunder white home. We're not sure how widespread these rumors are, but they're eventually put into the first official history of the yellow fever written by a well-known uh, printer in uh, Philadelphia named Matthew Carey. And he publishes it and Richard Allen reads this and he's outraged. And so Richard Allen writes his own pamphlet with Absalom Jones, um, which tries to set the record straight. And it's published in January and Richard Allen distributes it to members of the federal Congress coming back to white abolitionists to members of polite society. Um, he tries to spread the word far and wide through his pamphlet. And in that pamphlet, he talks about the medical and aid work he and other African-Americans had done. He talks about a woman named Sarah Bass, an African-American woman who goes into white homes and helps them recover from illness. Sarah Bass will eventually be his second wife when his first wife dies. So Richard Allen, you know, interacts with uh, African American women in the city of Philadelphia doing aid work. He talks about black leaders doing aid work. He talks about how he put his life on the line. He talks about the money that African Americans lost. He talks about the rumors and innuendo that spread about African Americans. And he's incredulous. He said, first of all, Many whites fled the city, including this guy who publishes this pamphlet, Matthew Carey. He went to Baltimore. Uh, many whites charged exorbitant sums for the work they did. He says, in many occasions, we didn't even ask for money. 
people forced us to accept a uh, payment. Um, he talks about whites uh, taking advantage of the yellow fever for nefarious purposes. He said, you know, there was a lot of things going on, but we put our lives on the line and then we ended up dying in the same percentage as whites, about two, three, maybe 400 African-Americans died out of a population of perhaps three or 4,000. So he's outraged. But the important thing is he puts that outrage to good use. He publishes his pamphlet. He publishes several hundred copies. He distributes these copies and then he gets a copyright. He's the first African-American author in the United States to get a, pam uh, uh, a copyright for his literary production. And uh, in that sense, I think you could say that he copyrighted, uh, you know, written black protest wow. uh, in the United States. Other people are writing, but he's the first person to go down to the federal copyright office and get the federal government to acknowledge his invention, um, which tells you that he's reading the Constitution, that he's thinking about his rights at a whole other level. And so down through the ages, lots of other African-American intellectuals, civil rights leaders, black protest readers, uh, leaders have read that uh, uh, protest document and honored Allen as uh, the first person to really uh, copyright black protest. Wow, thank you so much. One more writing, um, one more example of how lethal he was in his pen and then we're gonna get into his organization. Um, yep. in, uh, when John Joyce, December 1807, uh, John Joyce, Peter Mathis, uh, yeah. Matthias, um, kill a um, free black man, kill a, a white widow woman in a time where things could have got really tense racially, uh, yeah. really dangerous for African-Americans. Uh, Alan steps in, this time is not an example of his pen, but also his heart um, and his evangelistic and pastoral spirit. Uh, tell us about what took place there and tell us how Alan, how Alan uh, steps into this issue and how that continues uh, to be something that shows his spirit in his, in his class. I'm glad you asked about that because it's probably his least known publication. So he's writing this testimonial about two African-American figures who are condemned to death for various acts. And he's trying to create some sort of alternative picture in public discourse so that stereotypes don't run amok and um, you don't get a lot of backlash against African-Americans at a critical time for the abolitionist movement. So you can read these pamphlets in a lot of different ways, um, but they're more reform pamphlets. They're Richard Allen trying to say that here are young African-American men that got caught up in the criminal justice system. Um, you know, there's a lot of reasons for that. They didn't have a lot of economic opportunity. Um, they were pushed aside by society. So in one sense, he's condem condemning white society for not giving a lot of pathways up to African-Americans. He's also, you know, a, a moral reformer um, who's trying to give a sermon to people about, you know, staying on the true path. He's building a church. His church is growing at this time by leaps and bounds. And one of the reasons is because he's giving people an alternative. You know, when you come into the church, it's a safe space, but there are rules in the church, right? You have to come to uh, Sunday service. You have to do good work. You have to take these vows that you're going to be an upright citizen, meaning an upright citizen of the church, not just of the community. Um, Allen is a moral reformer, too, in a civil rights sense, where he's thinking in terms of the broader civil rights movement at the time. You know, he's thinking that African-Americans are in this really terrible position where individuals stand for the race, right? So he's really upset with that, but he says this is the reality of our civil rights movement. And he wants people to understand that they have to try to, you know, always think about the civil rights movement when they're working, when they're praying, when they're celebrating. So in one sense, he can be, I'll use this term, a fuddy-duddy, right? He likes, he likes hymns. He doesn't like people going to what are known as grog shops, bars, you know, and celebrating that way. So he can be a very stern moral reformer. And that's yes. why sometimes, you know, you read some of Richard Allen's 
uh, writings, his more reform writings, we can say, wow, I mean, he's really condemning people. You know, chill out, understand what's going on. He understands, but he's thinking about a larger um, kind of context here. But the other thing that's important about this is when he writes these more reform pamphlets in the early 1800s, he's also just about to write and publish in 1807 something called the African Supplement. Um, white Methodists have seen Richard Allen's church growing, and in the early 1800s, they try to take church property and tell black Methodists, um, we own the church property, and we actually control your operation. So we will tell you who will be your preachers, who will be your bishops. And Richard Allen says, no, no, no. We built the church from the ground up. We own the property. We own the church. And they get in this big fight. And Richard Allen eventually, with his fellow trustees, tells white, pro uh, white members of the uh, Methodist church, um, we're done. Um, we're going to write a whole new constitution. And he calls that the African Supplement. It's the supplement to the church rules and documents, which whites helped him write in the 1790s. And this African Supplement, you know, basically means what the name would imply. This is a strong African-centered um, statement about black power. The first um, rule in the African Supplement is blacks control the AME church. You can't do anything unless two thirds of black trustees in the church say you can do it. So yeah. you can't sell church property. You can't hire bishops or traveling preachers to come into our church unless we say so. So always remember that, you know, Richard Allen's thinking on all these levels and he sees these two young African-American men trapped in the criminal justice system. He goes and ministers to them. He yeah. talks about their spirit and he tries to somehow make you. And I think, you know, the final thing that's important about it is he points a finger at whites in a very uh, personal way. He says, don't ever think that sin is associated with color that it's certain or class or gender, you know, that only certain people are destined to sin. He says to people, reader, have you ever sinned in your heart? Have you ever thought of, um, you know, taking advantage of someone financially or sexually or whatever, you know, lustfully? He said, then you in the eyes of God are guilty too. So that's why you should forgive these young men too and think about their eternal soul. So, you know, Richard Allen is a community leader. He's a civil rights leader. He's a moral reform leader. Um, he's always and forever working on multiple levels uh, in ways that still astound me. Yeah, it's amazing uh, how his mind is three steps. Forget about chess. I mean, he's yeah. playing on six or seven different chess boards ahead of the yep. mentality of those that are the elites of the day. Uh, better yet, those in the African American circle, which we're going to get to now um, as we get into his organization. You're probably asked this question the most. It's probably the one that you're uh, most well versed on. So I'm just going to give you the floor. How in the world did the AME start? What what happened that Sunday in Prince George that made all these African Americans just all of a sudden work walk out of church and and no longer. Um, be separatists and uh, communists and and uh, Marxisms and, and all these other uh, terms that would have been thrown out if you uh, question if we have time. I want to ask you about at the end of uh, this notion of contextualizing history. I want to ask you that in a modern uh, thing. Sure. I would love to give your mind on that if we get time at the end. But let, let's get into it. Uh, uh, what happened that day and, and what caused this evolution of the AME Church? I love your passion and enthusiasm for this because um, you can't help but be passionate when you learn about the first walkout in American society. It's the first sit-in and then it's the first walkout. And so yes, um, if you hear uh, the Reverend Dr. Mark uh, Tyler talk about Richard Allen and the roots of the AME church, he, uh, he's very proud of this. He says, you know, uh, the first sit-in and the first uh, walkouts are not in the 20th century in the South. They are in the 18th century in the North, and they occur in Philadelphia at St. George's Methodist Church. It's the oldest Methodist church in America, um, and it's the biggest and most important Methodist church at the time. Richard Allen is brought to that church because he comes to Philadelphia in 
1786, just a few years after he bought himself out of bondage. And he's been traveling around the mid-Atlantic and he's been making a name for himself. Wherever he goes and preaches, people take note, white people, black people. So when the elders at uh, St. George's Methodist Church think about building up their church, including the African-American uh, parishioners in that church, they think there's one person to, to contact and bring over to the church. That's Richard Allen. So he starts ministering at St. George's. He, he, he gives... Uh, as he says in his autobiography, which you can read free and online, um, Gospel Labors of Richard Allen, just Google it. You'll find it on Documenting the American South and on Google Books. Um, he says, you know, he preached up to five times a day, uh, morning, noon, night at St. George's. He still had to work and earn a living. He was starting businesses at the time. So he, he preached five times a day and he brought all these black congregants probably as well as some whites too, into the St. George's fold. Um, and he's very proud of that. And they, of course, donated money to help build this church. And what Alan thought he was doing was building an interracial congregation. Again, a socially conscious uh, ministry. So he's not bringing people into St. George's under false pretenses. He thinks he's bringing people into the church that liberated him, the interracial church of um, you know, the countryside that he grew up on, uh, during the American Revolution, the church that sanctioned uh, meetings of, bl of black and white um, congregants. So that's what he's doing. And then when the church starts growing, the church plans uh, for growth by segregating African Americans. There's debate about whether they put African Americans in the back of the church first in the segregated pew or if they built a second floor um, with a segregated pew. Um, Richard Allen uses language at different times in his life. It may have happened in 1787. It may have happened a little after that. But the point is at some uh, time in Richard Allen's experience uh, at St. George's, there were enough African-Americans that white leaders got a little nervous and started segregating them. And again, Rich and Allen met with black leaders and uh, plotted a strategy. Um, he, he challenged segregation, hoping that one of two things would happen. In other words, they would go into St. George's Church and ignore the rules about where African-Americans should sit, not in the segregated pews. They'd go right down to the main pews, right at the center of the church, and they mm -hmm. would kneel on their knees and pray to Almighty God. Rich and Allen thought, Either the white congregation is going to tell white leaders of the church when they tried to remove African-Americans, no, you cannot do this. This is the, the house of God. It's an interracial church. We are going to uh, deconstruct those segregated pews. And then Richard Allen's vision would be validated, and it would be an interracial church, and that revolution would spread throughout the nation, to all Methodist churches and then throughout American society. And then if it didn't happen... Richard Allen and black congregants, African Americans, were going to get up on mass and walk out, and that's what happened. During the sermon, uh, Richard Allen and Absalom Jones were on their knees in prayer. Absalom Jones is older than Richard Allen, so he's a you know uh, a little more um, arthritic. And uh, white leaders in St. George's come up and say, "You have to get up," and um, they actually try to grab onto him. And Absalom Jones says, you know, stop harassing me. We're in prayer. This is a sacred act. You know, leave, leave us alone and we'll trouble you no more. And again, I think Richard Allen and Absalom Jones had plotted this out. They knew exactly what they would do if this happened. And they get up and all African-Americans uh, in the church, I think there's a small number who don't, um, but they get out, they get up and they walk out of the church. And as Richard Allen said, uh, we never came back. Um, now, I will just point out one very interesting and important thing. The roots of the AME church, and in one key sense, the black church in America, are born on bended knee. They're mm. born on bended knee. And so when we think that Richard Allen knelt in prayer first and the people said, get up, that ain't right. And Richard Allen said, no, we're going to stay down until we're done 
And then when we make our point, we're going to get them to walk out. That's the beginnings of the black church and in many ways, the civil rights movement too. Um, that's why Richard Allen is an eternally relevant figure for our time. Wow. Well, his organization doesn't stop uh, at AME. Uh, there is the other civil organizations that he start. Uh, talk a little bit about that. But before you go into that, if you don't mind, just talk about how him and his good friend, Absalom Jones, wrestled through how this split will look and be manifest. Yeah, the first thing is there's two different black churches that form in Philadelphia after they walk out. Um, right. It might be strange after what I, I've just uh, discussed that Alan would remain a Methodist, but for one thing, he feels really strongly about that Methodist vision that he initially had uh, when he was enslaved. He felt it was the, the, the vision that liberated him. He felt it was an interracial vision to start. Um, so he's going to stay in the Methodist church. Absalom Jones uh, goes towards the Episcopalian fold. So they form uh, under the uh, heading of Absalom Jones, the uh, African Episcopal Tur Church of St. Thomas's. And Richard Allen forms Mother Bethel AME Church, which is uh, African Methodist Episcopal Church. Um, and then there's the African Presbyterian Church, the African Baptist Church in Philadelphia. So by the early 1800s, you have four or five different churches in Philadelphia with different denominations speaking to, you know, different versions of black faith and ministry. Um, so Richard Allen stays in the black Methodist fold, but over time, as you get into the uh, 1820s, uh, early 1830s, Richard Allen dies in 1831. He's thinking not about these different ministries doing their own thing. He's thinking about bringing all ministries and activists together under one fold. So one of the things that he does at the end of his life is he holds the first uh, national black convention movement at Mother Bethel Church in September of uh, 1830. Um, this is a meeting of black leaders throughout the mid-Atlantic. So from Baltimore, Philadelphia, New Jersey. And what they're trying to do is address the worsening racial situation. Slavery has grown more powerful in the American nation. It's spread to the Southwest. Uh, there's a larger number of free blacks, but racism has reared its ugly head. So there's a lot of uh, um, angry words aimed at African-Americans, a lot of oppressive laws and policies aimed at African-Americans. So Richard Allen's trying to find a national solution to this. So um, he forms in, in many ways what's the precursor to the NAACP in September of 1830 by having a you know, non-denominational group of protesters forming something known as you know the National Group of Free Persons of Color, uh, trying to address civil rights concerns in the United States. And they talk about, you know, the way that slavery and racial injustice violate not only the word of God, but the Declaration of Independence, um, that African-Americans are fighting for um, equal rights. Uh, they're, right, they're fighting for all sorts of equalities under the law, um, things that are, um, you know, really sort of occurring throughout the nation that are... Um, appalling to African-Americans. In Ohio, African-Americans through the black laws can't serve on juries. They can't go to uh, equal schools with whites, even though they pay uh, taxes. Um, in some towns, they're getting expelled. So, um, you know, this is a harbinger of bad things to come. And Rich announces we've got to find, um, we've got to build a movement nationally that can stand up to this. And one of the things that Rich and Allen does investigate uh, in 1830 is the idea that maybe African-Americans um, should also explore going to another place to get equality and justice. And at that time, Alan thinks that place will be British Canada, because by then, British Canada is starting to talk about getting rid of slavery throughout the empire, and it's already been uh, outlawed in parts of Ontario. So Richard Allen as I said at the beginning, is really starting to uh, articulate this 
divided consciousness that W.E.B. Du Bois will talk about, you know, where on the one hand, we want to embrace our Americanist through rights and liberties that we should be able to claim. And yet we're not allowed to do that. And so we feel our otherness as African descended people. And so we might have to find other places wherein we can celebrate um, and explore that side of our identity. And, you know, Du Bois wrings his hands about that throughout his entire life. But here's Richard Allen at the end of his life. He's going to die the next year uh, exhibiting that same double consciousness. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, two more things as it relates to his organization in the AME church context, I uh, think that are, are critical. One is external, the other is internal um, conflict that took place with Allen. Um, one is the, the need for him to buy back the church because of uh, what took place, an amazing event that I would love for you to walk us through. Yep. And, then, and then the internal conflict that took place uh, in the latter years of, of even uh, those that are part of Mother Bethel uh, coming against uh, AM, uh, uh, Bishop Allen and causing what we would call in our context a church split uh, yep. uh, later on. So it's amazing. It's a vivid scene that you highlight uh, wonderfully yep. in there. Um, that sort of puts this into gravitas um, on how real it was. Yeah. You know, Richard Allen's fully human. And so these two incidents um, exemplify his humanity in different ways. You know, his, his grand humanity and then the ways that he is just an institution builder who's trying to protect his institution from some internal challenges and internal strife. So the first one is just holding on to his church when white leaders – within the Methodist fold, try first to take it through spiritual and legal means and then literally try to buy it. So uh, when last I was talking about this in 1807, Richard Allen put out the African supplement claiming black church property and the black church itself as, you know, his and the black communities and white leaders, you know, they kind of humor him for a little while, but by 1812, in other words, a couple of years later, they're back at it. They're coming back to the church and they're saying, listen, you know, we're in control of this property and we're in control of who runs this property. So they start saying things like, you know, as the presiding bishop in this community, we're allowed to give the sermons and assign uh, elders to you and preachers to you. And, you know, they post notes uh, at the church and around the community saying, um, so here's your preacher for this Sunday. It's going to be this white dude. He's going to show up and he's going to start preaching. And Richard Allen says, no, that's not going to happen. So they go back and forth. You know, a white preacher shows up, black congregants block him. A white preacher shows up in another case, uh, black preachers are on the stage, you know, giving these ear-splitting sermons. Uh, by 1815, it's gotten very confrontational. Um, white preachers show up and say, we're going to preach at your church, which is our church. And Richard Allen and the black community say, no, you're not. And on one occasion... A, a, a white minister actually goes to Richard Allen's house and he says, so I'm going to do this. I'm going to show up to your church. It's my right. I'm going to give a, a, a sermon. There's nothing you can do about it. Um, I've heard though that, you know, um, members of the black community might be there and that they might have guns or knives. And I want you to pledge to me that this won't happen. And I hope you'll give me your word on this. And Richard Allen looks at him and he says, as I say in the book, I've heard that rumor. And he just lets it hang there. <laughs> uh, when, when the white preacher shows up, he opens the door, he looked in, and he says, you know, there's a preacher on stage giving a sermon. The pews are fully occupied and the aisles are blocked, you know, with benches. You can't get through. And they look at this preacher and, you know, Allen's threats just scare the man away combined with what he saw. Now, Richard Allen didn't say that people would get violent uh, or <laughs> anything like that. But he did say, you know, <laughs> I heard those rumors and by any means available or by any means necessary. So what elders do is they actually just put the church up for auction and they dare Richard Allen to actually either go to legal authorities and say, you can't do this or bid for his own church. So what Richard Allen does is he finds someone who can bid for his church. He's a very diligent man. He saved up money. 
and he pays a pretty hefty sum, um, but he buys the church back. But what he also does at the same time, again, remember thinking about Alan working on multiple planes, mm -hmm. uh, he's also initiated um, legal proceedings. Um, so they go to the Pennsylvania Supreme Court, they get a white lawyer. The white lawyer says, you know, one of the great tenets of American religious democracy is you can never force a congregation to accept a preacher, you know, and this goes back to Puritan society. It, it flows through, um, American, uh, religious, uh, organizations and in the Pennsylvania Supreme court, uh, the highest law on the land says, um, we accept that legal reasoning. And they declare uh, in favor of Richard Allen and the Amy Church. So in April of, 26, of 1816, the Pennsylvania Supreme Court declares legally Richard Allen in control of his church, which mm -hmm. means they can now set up a denomination. They're not just an independent black church in the white Methodist fold. They set up an independent denomination. So that's why you see the AME Church uh, officially as a denomination coming online in 1816. Now, a couple of years after that, Richard Allen, he's elderly. Um, he's in his 60s. Younger people in the church feel like he's not speaking to some of their concerns. Um, and, you know, they want him to light, uh, loosen the reins of church uh, power, you know. So, as I said, Richard Allen is a moral reformer. He has rules. Um, you can't do these things. You can't do these things. So, there's a young man who has inappropriate relations with a young woman, and he is expelled from the AME church. Um, he disputes some of the facts, but he basically thinks, you know, Richard Allen doesn't speak to the younger generations coming up. Um, and he's not alone, and there's other people who do this. Mm -hmm. And so he challenges Alan. He eventually tries to create sort of like a secession movement from within the church. And there's a neighboring church uh, that also claims to be um, uh, within the AME fold that's located behind Mother Bethel. Um, and so they kind of have this battle for the soul of the AME church right there in a kind of corner of Philadelphia and Richard Allen wins the day, but it gets mm -hmm. very confrontational. Yeah. Um, some of these young men actually go up to Richard Allen when he comes and visits their secessionist church. And one of them spits in his face and he just stares him down and eventually, as I say, wins the day so that these two churches will come together under the fold of Richard Allen's AME. But, you know, I think this shows you that he's fully human because when you look at this incident, you can actually be sympathetic to both sides. You know, yeah. um, you have a lot of people in Philadelphia at the time with the black community, within the black community saying, you know, racism is rising. We don't have a lot of economic opportunities. The last thing I need is for you to lecture us too, for you to tell us too, that um, we're going to be expelled from this sanctuary and safe space. But Richard Allen is again, thinking in that larger national and, international context. You know, I'm building a movement. I have to remain in control of my church. And you can look at him too and say, you know, he didn't have to go that far or he didn't have to say the things he said because, you know, he had some very choice words for these dissenters. But um, he's thinking in very different terms than these young men. So I think it's just a, it's a great reminder that he is human, that this is a very difficult time for the early uh, abolitionist and civil rights struggle. And, you know, it's hard to always be on the right side of things. Yeah. yeah. His, 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 his standing in the community. And if that falls apart, what happens to the civil rights struggle? Yeah. He's balancing that pressure and that loneliness of leadership. And yes. um, the irony is that it mirrors what you see happen in the context of church today, not, Black yes. church, white church, but church in politics and business uh, where people, uh, you know, uh, that dark night feeling, you either die early and become the hero, live long enough, become the villain. Um, yes. And so his voice kind of wore on them a little bit seemingly there. Um, happens with great coaches.
in sports. Yeah. You, you'll see that. Um, just people just tired of that coach yelling those things out. And uh, he was very bulldogish about where he stood on his moral stance. And he, yes. um, it was both uh, religious and social. Um, yeah. He felt, as you stated, that the legitimacy of the movement was um, closely, co uh, closely connected to um, the uh, moral legitimacy there um, that they had uh, as, a, as a whole, as a people. He, um, let's talk about him as a person um, as our time is winding down. I want to respect your time. You've been so gracious to us. Um, one of the things that I think capture it, it's sort of weird, but it captured it for me, um, is his paintings. Um, how he, even before, this is not, you know, you know, Instagram generation, Facebook, um, this technology has not advanced. Um, so it's more strategic on how you present yourself in these portraits, how he yeah. does it um, on these old portraits. And then talk to us about the last one in the date of the AME foundings on there and your, and your inference on what that was all about. Well, I'm really glad you asked that um, for a couple of reasons. First, it, it allows me just to really quickly go back to the previous thing because you had a I think a really great analogy there to, you know, uh, you see this in sports where a legendary coach, the further they go on, their message uh, withers when you meet young people. We're seeing this now, and I'm, I'm sure you're going through this in a lot of community dialogues where you are yeah. with Black Lives Matter and elder generations of civil rights protesters. We see this in Rochester. I see this with my students. You know, I'm teaching a summer class now on reformers, um, and they come into class and their attitude, which is wonderful because it's all about how can they take us to the next step is no one did anything before us because we wouldn't be in the situation if, if they did. Right. Mm -hmm. And I show them, you know, Frederick Douglass or Fannie Lou Hamer or Richard Allen, and they have to scratch their head and go, well, okay, wow. Maybe they help get us to a point where we can go to the next stage. So I think yeah. it's really important to remember that. Um, and, that's a good segue to the imagery um, of Richard Allen and other black leaders, because the first and most important thing is that we see Richard Allen. We have images of him. There's, that's not a mistake. He wanted to be seen. Mm. This is at a time where, as you said, we don't have all of the digital technology right now, or even the photographic technology of a later era. Um, so, you know, we don't have a lot of images of African Americans, protest leaders, much less um, oppressed people in any number of communities. So Richard Allen, as someone who is visible, becomes, you know, much more powerful and important because he's symbolic, right? He's a symbol of the struggle, the civil, the early civil rights struggle that he's trying to build. Um, his imagery is important for another reason in this regard, because he is self-consciously trying to be seen, you know, mm. he's trying to say, don't ignore me. Don't not look at me. Right. So at a time when revolutionary figures in American society, right. The people who have won the American revolution are getting paintings done um, and uh, striking these classic poses, right. Because they're the quote unquote, fathers of the nation, Richard Allen is saying, hey, if you like my work as a preacher, as a protester, um, paint me, cast me in some sort of image. So one of the uh, most important images there, I believe it's the second image, 1811, Raphael Peel. You know, that's the, Raphael or uh, Rembrandt Peel, that's the famous Peel family. You know, they're perhaps the most famous famous. A portrait family in early America. Um, they they cast portraits of George Washington, of other revolutionary leaders. So at some point, they come across Richard Allen and they say, we'd like to do you. Or someone says, you should craft a portrait of Richard Allen. Or Richard Allen says, you know, it'd be great to have a, an image of a, a, a black leader. And that happens again and again. So we have three images of Richard Allen in his lifetime. The last one that is um, on the biography comes from 1820 mm -hmm. um, graving, a wooden graving that's eventually turned into a kind of lithograph. But that's Alan at the, uh, 
sort of end of his life, still struggling to hold on to his power as a great community leader. It's when that internal dissension occurs that I was talking about around 18, 20, 22. Um, but he's still this incredibly galvanizing figure, you know, that image is an older man holding onto a book, really gripping onto it with his hands, but he's got gravitas and authority. Mm -hmm. um, the earlier one, he's a little more stoic, but he's pointing to pointing down at a biblical verse. Um, and, you know, there you can think about the message of the port, which portrait, which is I'm a strong black leader who started a black church and a black organization, but I'm always, I'm also talking about morality. I'm talking about the word of God, which says slavery is a sin, you know, and his first portrait when he's in his twenties, um, it's cast in the 1780s when he's first free and he's gone down to the inaugural Methodist convention in 1784 in Baltimore. He's just full of optimism and the painting is in these lighter shades of color with blues and he's got a smile on his face. It's just, Alan is this winning black protest uh, and religious figure. So it's sort of like the optimism of an interracial future that African-Americans as well as white citizens will be part of the new America. So each portrait tells a tale um, associated with Alan's life, but here's the next step. So Alan dies in 1831. Frederick yeah. Douglass um, escaped slavery in 1838, publishes his autobiography in 1845, and then uh, moves to Rochester and publishes The North Star uh, in uh, 1848. Um, one of Frederick Douglass's great heroes is Richard Allen. Yeah. Think about that. In, in Baltimore, where Douglass kind of grew up, um, he worked as an enslaved person who was hired out to uh, ship caulkers in Baltimore. He did a lot of other things there. He grew up in Baltimore. There was a strong Amy church there. His wife, Anna Murray, was familiar with that church. Uh, Richard Allen um, was a well-known figure in Baltimore, in Maryland, and New Jersey. His birthday, February 14th, became uh, a kind of holiday in black communities. Um, when Richard Allen, when Frederick Douglass publishes uh, writings in the 1850s and later on in his life, he talked about the need to go to Philadelphia and go to the Amy Church because this is the most important person there is. Um, Frederick Douglass never knew when he was born. He says that his mother probably, you know, told him a tale about being born on Valentine's Day. I'm just going to say I buy it. I think his mother and other black community leaders knew February 14th was a sacred day in the black community. Um, so I'm getting to the point here. Um, you, okay. Frederick Douglass reveres Richard Allen to his dying day. He mentions him in the 1890s, a few years before he died. Um, Frederick Douglass does the same thing that Richard Allen did with portraits. He forced people to take pictures of him and he thought photography would be this revolutionary medium because he grew up in the 1850s when early photographic inventions were just coming online. He thought because photography didn't lie, it would not create these horrible stereotyped images of African Americans. And he forced Africa, he forced photographers to take pictures of him, like a famous portrait of him with his fists up and white printers would crop it. And Frederick Douglass, they put my fist back up. Mm. You can Google, just Google Frederick Douglass and fists and you will see it. Um, so Frederick Douglass, according to the Harvard scholar, John Stauffer, and you probably know this, uh, Reverend Hurt, um, it's a book called Picturing Frederick Douglass. He claims that Frederick Douglass is the most pictured American the most photographed American of the 19th century because everywhere Douglas went, he forced people to take photos of him. And because photography was so new and because someone like Lincoln was assassinated uh, during the civil war, not a lot of other people uh, were pictured in white society. So he makes the claim that we have more pictures of Frederick Douglass that we know about than any other figure, maybe except for either, uh, U Ulysses S. Grant or a yeah. customer who were kind of these celebrities after the Civil War. But think about that. 
Yeah. Frederick Douglass created all of these memory portraits of himself on purpose. This wasn't a mistake. Um, and so uh, John Stauffer makes the link from Frederick Douglass's time to Black Lives Matter and cell phones, saying Frederick Douglass would be very at home now with what we're seeing in cell phone technology and what happened in the horrible tragedy of George Floyd. I think the same thing would, could be said of Richard Allen. He knew yeah. that you need to be seen and that you needed to use any kind of portrait technology available so that people get a different view of you. And from portrait technology to photographic technology to cell phone technology, there's always been a black leader and a black protest movement saying the image will set us free. And yes. that's what we're doing now. Yes, uh, that, that's exactly what I was getting at with that question. Uh, talk to us about um, the final picture and the date that's on there as far as AME being established and the controversy behind that because he's still a slave uh, technically on that date and your assessment about that. Now you're talking about the one from the 1820s or the first one from the 1784? I think it's the uh, it's either the second or the last one uh, where it dates um, the AME Church starting um, when he was still a slave in Delaware. Um, and okay. You, you, right, yeah, right. You, so uh, he had it already right, right. in his movie. Um, so that's the one where he's very optimistic and he's kind of um, smiling. That's the one that was in Howard University. It's a famous oil painting. Um, and they had they had that in the collection of Howard University for a number of years, and I think you can tell why now, because it's an optimistic portrait of a young rising black leader during a very momentous time of the nation's history after the revolution. And um, I actually went to Howard University, and I could not they didn't have that portrait hanging, so I think they're very protective of that portrait. Now the second portrait. Um, let me get a copy out. This is the second portrait. Whoa. Mm -hmm. That's the one from 1811. You see he's pointing down. Yeah. Now, 1811. So he's free there and he's pointing to a biblical verse and saying, um, when you paint me, make sure you paint me as a literate person um, mm. in – you know, very distinguished garb, pointing to a biblical verse, basically lecturing whites, slavery's a sin. And then the final portrait at the end of his life is the one that's on the biography. That's where he's being challenged from within in 1820-22 from those uh, young members of the Methodist Connection. And, you know, having his portrait cast was a way for him to kind of claim control as an elder within the community saying, I'm not dead yet. I still mm -hmm. got a lot to say. Yeah, absolutely. And I may be misremembering, uh, but there is a context of where the AME is church is established, but the year is uh, the year that he's still a slave in Delaware. And uh, I believe you made the inference that it was birthed in his mind and he puts that date. Right, right, yeah, that's absolutely now. right. Yeah. And so, what I think is really interesting about Richard Allen is going all the way back to that um, early context in Delaware or Philadelphia, where you've got uh, interracial um, camp meetings, a lot of preachers giving these fire and brimstone sermons uh, during the revolution about a just God. You know, I think that's in Allen's mind where he first created his vision of an interracial church of a social gospel ministry. And it's very clear that he always had from, you know, basically the American revolutionary on, era on an idea of a revolutionary church where um, social justice was at the forefront. So he had the picture in his mind of that um, when he was a teenager. Yeah, great. There's there's so much that um, time has eluded us that I wanted to get into as far as uh, him and wrestling through Haiti and oh, uh, definitely the you know, Liberia and the intellect that he had of acknowledging and knowing 
and listening to the voices of others that this is not good for the enslaved people. Uh, his success as a businessman um, yep. and how he left a generational wealth behind each of his children, um, yep. land and products, um, uh, how he was self-made and but never allowed that uh, to dilute his zeal uh, for freedom for those that are enslaved. And he easily could have just lived a lavish life and been separative. Um, and you see a lot of that mirrored in uh, some of the internal struggles of African-American people today and some of the external struggles as a country of how to um, integrate us into some of from the wealth gap, gap to the health gap, uh, right. to the educational gap, um, to uh, prison system, <clears throat> excuse me, and so on. And uh, so I just invite those of you that are listening to pick up the book for yourself. I welcome dialogue on it at any time uh, with any of you. Uh, like I said, donation of any amount, sign up for our mailing list. We'll get that to you. We have over 80 copies left of it. We gave it, given many away. If you're uh, coming by our church on Sunday where we'll be giving out uh, meals, pizza, masks, book bags, I'll have that book ready for you there as well for our grab and go at um, 11 till, uh, till everything run out. It's going to be a grand grab and go as we'll be taking some time off uh, from doing that. But So we're going to have a big one. So if you need a book bags, if you're um, looking for a warm meal, um, there will be various, we're partnering with community businesses to ensure they uh, have a sense of stability during this time. Uh, the Hurt Foundation, our social wing of activism, uh, with this being our spiritual wing here at the Hurt for the Hurting, is doing that. And so we invite you to come and pick up those books there. We'll have those available for you as well. I wanted to get this last question in, if I may, um, to you. Um, as a historian, a lifeline to the present and future, uh, historians play such a critical role um, in not just us um, not repeating the negative of our past, but understanding the illumination of, of the past that's from a positive realm. Uh, how do you um, answer the persons that ask the question of contextualizing history um, from Jefferson to Washington uh, to the treatment of African-American people uh, back then in light of the mindset of the cultural uh, treatment of women? We'll have some wonderful guests, uh, some uh, black, female intellects with us tomorrow to talk about certain things. How should history be contextualized? What's the do's and don'ts um, in doing that? Um, how do we draw intelligent conclusions um, in, the, in that contextualization? Save the easy one for last. Um, <laughs> that, first of all, it's a great question because this is a question that is on the minds of a lot of different people right now. You know, yeah. you and I'm sure, uh, Everyone out there watching is familiar with the 1619 Project, and I think that's been amazing for stimulating um, all these and inspiring all these great debates about how we look at the past, not just how we teach it, but how we conceive of it. Um, and as I said at the very beginning of this interview, one of the reasons I wrote the book, the biography of Richard Allen, is to solve the riddle of people who would say, but back then you know, no one knew. Um, it was a different time. And I would say Richard Allen knew <laughs> and a lot of other African-Americans at the time who were protesting and they knew. So I want that to be there clearly as a kind of challenge to anyone who says it's, you know, just an either or. Um, like there's this magical line you passed where all of a sudden everyone's conscious about civil rights, but before that they weren't. No one was. Um, on the other hand, I do think it's a more complex issue if you're talking about different communities. The issue isn't who knew, it's who knew when. So, you know, you've got a vanguard of African-American leaders. You've got a vanguard in the African-American community who are feeling oppression and saying it's wrong. Um, but there's uh, a majority white culture that is saying, we don't see a problem here, you know, we think this is legal. So then the question for Richard Allen is, how do you convince those people? How do you get people to see that there's a problem here? So that's where I think the word context matters. I don't think we use the word context to say, 
okay, no one knew. No. Richard and Allen knew. A lot of people knew there were problems. That's how change is created. People in the vanguard pushing. But on the other side of it, it's how are people reacting. And that's where you have to say, okay, what can we do to push the ball forward? So if you watch sports, I think of, you know, they have those 360 views where they'll put you on one side of a basketball court or a football field. And then they'll go all the way over to the other side and they'll say, here's what it looks like from the offense's perspective. Here's what it looks like from the defensive perspective. So how do you get to Thomas Jefferson and say, um, you're a hypocrite and a sinner and you got to, you got to end slavery now. Um, We saw that Jefferson grew up in a society where that was legal. His father bequeathed it to him. He was going to bequeath it to his kids. And then at some point he says to himself during the revolution, wait a minute, this is wrong. We can't build a society on these grounds. And then when he writes the declaration of independence, Richard Allen reads the declaration of independence and goes, I love this. I've been thinking this all along. Right. So now we've got a dialogue between those two people, but, they're not on the same page. So that's all for me. That's the starting point for having these dialogues about the past as a complex place um, where we can look at Richard Allen and say, there's your vanguard. That's the person who's going to push history forward. And we put context into play as a concept because we have other people who are resistant. Same thing for now. So a hundred years from now, someone's going to, st- write a history of our time and they're going to look down and say, I don't see what the problem is. All these people are protesting. Why didn't they win? And we'll say, because they weren't in control. They didn't have power. And a lot of people who couldn't even see a problem, right? A lot of people who can't even think there's a problem are saying, I don't get it. There's no problem there. So Mm. the historian who's writing about that's going to say, all right, we've got to look at history from different perspectives. From Richard Allen's perspective, Majority white society is behind the curve from, you know, Thomas Jefferson's perspective. He's just getting around to things now, (laughs) which is a hard concept for the vanguard to understand. But this is what Richard Allen is trying to think of as a protest leader. All right. I've got different communities here. And that's why at different times in his life, he adopts different protest vehicles because early on he's full of optimism. I can convince people change is going to come. And then 30 years later, he says change didn't come. Maybe we should leave America, right? Mm -hmm. Um, I think that's a really powerful indictment of the way that people were not willing to listen to him. It's not that they weren't ready for it. It's that they didn't want to, you know? So we we can then talk about backlash, you know? But if we just say either or, we miss all of that. And, and I think that's something that we have to talk about because it's it's where we're at right now. How yeah. do we create change? And one of the things I'm very worried about for younger people, I, I say this saying for my friends and colleagues who are in the Black Lives Matter movement, they've created the revolution we need, right? They've created that next stage back to them. Mm-hmm. But they're, they're, they're in a generation that, you know, is a news cycle in terms of attention spans. And Richard Allen spent 50 years of his life as an activist and didn't get what he wanted. Frederick Douglass spent 50 years of his life as an activist and got part of what he wanted. Richard Allen died before emancipation. Frederick Douglass lived through the Civil War and got part of it and then saw horrible backlash and a rise of lynching. Fannie Lou Hamer died before we got to where we are now. But she's, you know, spent decades struggling. How do we tell young people around the world, not just in America, you know, movements are built through sacrifice and time. Yeah. You know, that's what I'm worried about. And that's why I think context matters, where we can go back and say, you know, you have to look at things from different perspectives so they understand what building a movement means, why a legal victory now might be a good thing to say we move the debate forward. And so what I'm around to, this is where I'll leave it with my students. Just this week, they figured it out after five weeks in a summer course. 
they're starting to talk about in history how different movements relate to one another and how yeah. different generations pick up the baton. And I said, that's it. It's, I wish I could wave a wand and say it's, it's right. It's the revolution that Richard Allen or Frederick Douglass or we want, it. but that's not happening. So how do we push that forward? We need to have that anger and spirit, but we also need to think that there's going to be resistance. So maybe we need to think in terms of a relay race. <laughs> how are we, what are we doing with that baton? Because what we think is how come no one started the race? And what I want to say is, are you ready? Richard Allen's coming down with a baton. He's going to give it to you. What are you going to do? You got the, you got the next hundred yards. And what you should be thinking is not why didn't someone start the race, but holy crap, he got me a hundred yards further than I should be. What am I going to do with it when I run? You know, and who am I handing it off to? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's wonderful. Thanks so much for sharing that. Uh, books that you would recommend for people to read. Um, it could be on history, American history, whatever. Um, any books you would recommend for us and uh, how can people, if they had questions or want to get your work, uh, how could they find it? Well, the first book I'm going to recommend is this brand new history in the last six months of the AME Church by Dennis C. Dickerson, who you probably know, uh, Reverend Hurt, he's a towering figure Within the Amy Church, he was the historiographer of the Amy Church, kind of grew up in the Amy Church. He's also a professor of history um, at Vanderbilt, one of the mm. you know great institutions of learning, um, Dennis C. Dickerson. Um, he's written on civil rights figures like Whitney Young. He's written on Richard Allen. He just produced this big mammoth history of the Amy Church that goes from Richard Allen's time to our own time. So- mm talking about the challenges of the Amy church in the time of AIDS uh, during the civil rights struggle, women in the church. He covers a lot of great things. So um, that's a wonderful, wonderful volume. Um, Picturing Frederick Douglass, the volume I mentioned by John Stauffer and a couple of others. It's an incredible book about uh, Frederick Douglass and the power of imagery. And it reprints about 125 images of Frederick Douglass. Um, just amazing. Uh, the new biography of Frederick Douglass by David Blight is, you know, uh, just a wonderful, amazing book because, you know, this is the person after Frederick Douglass or after Richard Allen, um, you know, the person who picked up the baton from Richard Allen. Um, but it also shows you what black protests looked like during the era of Lincoln and the way that Frederick Douglass really helped make abolition a reality in the mm. mid 19th century. Um, and then um, one more book that uh, I'm sure many of you are familiar with you, you two, um, they can't kill us all. It's a history of black lives matter and protest in our own time. It's like, if you could write history at the same time that it's happening, that's a, uh, that's a book you would, you would write. Um, and you know, it's really from like Ferguson till just a couple of years ago, but it's before George, George Floyd. Mm -hmm. So it's a portrait in time of a movement being built. Um, and you know, it's even more relevant right now, but it's just, it's, it's one of those things that you look at and you say, you know, uh, that's, that's a book that challenges us all to get out of the house and do more than just write and think about protest. Yeah. Thanks so much for sharing that. Uh, where can people find you? Um, once we get through this pandemic, they want to bring you in to speak, things of that nature. Uh, what's the best way to do that? Email is just, you know, classic email is great. I'm, uh, I'm going to have to create a website, but um, right now, you can go to the Rochester Institute of Technology if you forget any of the information I'll give you, but I'm in the Department of History at the Rochester Institute of Technology. That's not the University of Rochester. It's RIT. My email is uh, rsngsm at rit.edu. Um, Pastor Hurt will, uh, I'm sure, share that information with you. You can just drop me an email. Uh, I'd love to talk to you more. I'm happy to come back on with you if, you know, uh, 
uh, this pandemic ever goes away, um, I would love to visit your church sometime. As I say, I was born in California. Uh, so I'd love to get back out there sometime. And of course, we'd love to see you all out here in the home of Frederick Douglass. Yes, That's sir. Congregation, yes. it would be great to have you out here. Yes, Lord, get us through this. We're definitely going to hold uh, both ends of those sticks, uh, you here yep. and me there, uh, for that fellowship and camaraderie and to see some historical sites and experience uh, the intimacy of one-on-one -on -one in person gathering, which uh, COVID-19 just erased from our, our deck now. Uh, I'm gonna whisper a word of prayer. Uh, and for this time, we are grateful for you and don't let nobody tell you nothing less than the fact that you are the man, you are the man, uh, Professor Richard S. Newman. Uh, Father, thank you uh, for this time we spent. Thank you for the intellect of this scholar, this giant. Thank you for the life, the legacy, the love of Bishop Richard Allen. Thank you for the AME Church. Thank you for your church now, even in the midst of all that we are facing, pandemic, civil unrest, political chaos, mental strain, economic uncertainty, you're yet still working. Be with us, all these things we pray for Jesus' sake, amen. Amen. All right, thank you all for listening. Share this to someone, tell someone about this book, get this book, uh, let us know how we can get it to you. It's yours.